people are starting to join, so uh, we can get started with the introduction. So, um, hello everyone. It's my uh, pleasure to, to uh, welcome you all to this week's edition of the Synthesis Workshop at the Simons Institute. Um, I'm, and I'm really delighted to introduce today's speaker, Professor Jerry Zhu from the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison. Uh, Jerry is a full professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Wisconsin. Um, and uh, his work is uh, broadly in the field of machine learning. He has worked on multiple aspects of machine learning um, and in particularly has made uh, landmark contributions to several topics, including uh, especially in machine learning theory. Um, Jerry has received many honors and awards, um, including particularly an ICML classic paper prize. Um, now, let me say a few words about uh, the uh, tutorial here that Jerry is giving today, right? So, uh, so Jerry is someone from the field of machine learning and our uh, Simons program and this, to, this uh, workshop series is broadly speaking in the field of formal methods and programming systems and related areas. And um, uh, I think Jerry is actually, even though he's not in the field uh, of formal methods and programming systems, um, he is particularly well suited to give this tutorial. Um, in recent years, Jerry's research has been on topics like machine teaching and adversarial machine learning, which uh, as many of you will see, uh, has direct uh, relations to uh, topics like program synthesis and uh, formal verification. Um, also, uh, I had the, the pleasure of uh, co-organizing a dark stool seminar about four years ago with Jerry on the topic of machine learning and formal methods, which is one of the first such meetings as we saw the two fields coming together. And I think um, we have seen, uh, especially in synthesis, a growing interest and use of machine learning. Um, so I think Jerry is really well suited because although we have seen a lot of use of machine learning and synthesis, I think the use of machine learning theory to develop a, the theory of synthesis is still at, at its uh, nascent stages. And I hope this tutorial can serve as a kind of a catalyst uh, to, to, to bring new ideas into the, into the synthesis area. So with that, uh, Jerry, uh, thank you for giving this tutorial. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction, Sanjit. Um, as Sanjit mentioned, I'm uh, really an outsider. Uh, so what I want, plan to do today is to go over um, some of the sort of inner works of uh, machine learning and to try to build a bridge. Uh, in, in, trying to do, in trying to do so, um, I acknowledge that I don't speak your language. Um, so uh, I would extremely welcome people to interrupt and to ask questions, clarification, uh, or make comments at any moment. And Sanjit, please do help me uh, in that regard. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, let's get started. So today, uh, depending on you know how, how fast I can go, I plan to go over a bunch of things. So the talk is roughly speaking split into two parts. The beginning of the talk is uh, things we already know in uh, machine learning that has been you know well developed for a while. Uh, this is essentially the notion of passive learning or pack learning. You heard of it all the time or statistical learning, learning from uh, so-called ID data. I'll explain all these things. Now, the theory is extremely well developed, but on the other hand, it is also limiting in that the learning agent interact with the environment in a very specific way. And this may not cover a lot of the interaction protocols that we might be uh, interested in in formal methods. So after that, I'm going to branch out and uh, you know, start to look at some of the more uh, you know, interesting um, branches of machine learning. So we will start with active learning. I will talk a little bit about this notion of teaching, which is the flip side of learning. Then we will look, um, spend some time on uh, so-called sequential decision-making. Uh, so online learning, multi-on bandits and reinforcement learning. All right, as I was saying earlier, the hope is uh, these are going to be uh, just core machine learning concepts. And my talk will not have examples in uh, synthesis or formal methods, uh, but I hope uh, this provides a um, brief outline so that we see what is available uh, at a very high level in the machine learning field from a theoretical perspective. 
and what we can borrow uh, to bear in, uh, in our study of formal methods. So with that, let me start with uh, the basic setting of passive learning. Uh, this is like the most important slide. Uh, I want to make sure that we are all on the same page to establish this terminology. Uh, we will be looking at, uh, uh, for now, let's think of very simple classification problem. Okay, so that's what we will start with. Uh, so I'm going to use the notion of X for an input space. And that just means, you know, the item that you give to the system. All right, so this could be, uh, for now, let's say natural numbers, one, two, three, uh, et cetera. Now, that's going to be capital X. Capital Y is going to be our output space or label space. So for example, uh, in the simplest case, binary classification, we have zero, one label. So if you give me a number like 10, I'm going to somehow predict whether it's zero or one class. Okay, so binary, or we can think of it as negative or positive, okay? Um, with that, I'm going to start introduce the notion of uh, essentially a classifier, but uh, let's formally call it a hypothesis. Uh, because it's hypothesis, let's use H. So H is a function. It's a function from the X space mapping to Y. Uh, in this talk, I'm going to uh, frequently use an example, which is uh, this little H I being the indicator function of X greater than or equal to I. So, you know, if you have, for example, X one, sorry, H one, that's just going to classify every natural number as one, okay? Uh, X H2 will be a classifier that classifies one, the number one as zero class, but uh, two and three and uh, beyond as the positive class, so as ones. So I'm going to sometimes use the um, alternative notation HI uh, with this uh, like this string of um, labels and they just denote like where the negative class ends and where the positive class starts. Uh, so in the natural number order, right? So H I literally that I is the ith position is where the, the positive class, the one class starts, okay? So these are the, uh, the hypotheses that we will be looking at. And on top of that, uh, we will have a hypothesis space, capital H, um, this is in general uh, a subset, and in fact, we should have a true subset of uh, uh, all possible such functions. So for example, my capital H could just be these little HIs. Uh, so it, it, it is a threshold function, right? So it's a family of threshold functions with different threshold location I. Okay, so it's an infinite class, uh, but it's very simple. It doesn't include any other functions that uh, you know, map say odd numbers to one, even numbers to zero. We, we are not including those uh, in my example here, but in general, uh, that's my hypothesis space. Okay, and finally, I'm going to uh, say that there's a target function. Uh, this is denoted as H star. Uh, that is something we want to learn. Okay, so this is the hidden function and the world is going to generate data for us according to this H star. And here we distinguish two cases. One is when H star is in my hypothesis space. So for example, my space of uh, threshold classifiers. And in this case, we call the thing uh, realizable. So the setting is uh, known as realizable. For example, uh, we could say H star is that particular thre threshold function H 2021. Uh, so that's going to be a function that classifies all, you know, first 2020 numbers, natural numbers as zero. And then starting from 2021, it's going to classify everything as one afterwards. Okay, so that's that's that. Now, of course, you could also have a situation where uh, the true target function H star is not in your fun, uh, function family, not in your hypothesis space. So here's a concrete example. Uh, H star is this function that's all ones except at the second position, it is a zero. Okay, so that is not representable by my hypothesis space. Okay, we will consider both cases. And uh, in this case is called agnostic or unrealizable. All right, so I want to pause a little bit because this is like the most important slide to anchor our, our uh, you know, the translation between machine learning and uh, uh, formal methods, uh, in particular synthesis. So one question, actually, I have a question, right, for, for, for you guys. 
Um, I think this is uh, uh, quite related to how one could think of uh, program synthesis, where the hypothesis space seem to be all the programs that we can synthesize from, a, say, a given grammar. And uh, H star would be the, the correct program. It's specified in some ways, right? And it seems like uh, X and Y would be the input and output behavior of my program. If you query, if you give the program an X, it's, it should output Y, for example. Uh, is this a valid uh, interpretation? Sanjay, yeah. maybe it's yeah. a question for you. Sure, it, I think that is a valid uh, uh, analogy. Uh, one point of difference though, is that uh, in, in program synthesis, uh, uh, typically you, you don't have a specific target. Like you don't have just specific target. You have a specification that defines a set of correct hypotheses, right? And so uh, and as long as you get anything in that set, you're fine. That is actually a very interesting point. Um, right, so there, there could be um, the notion that you truly have two different H star functions that really have different, uh, you know, um, uh, they, they map X to different Y's. Uh, in that case, yes, we will have a family of H stars and that's not a setting considered in machine learning. We typically say there is just one H star, a concrete function. Okay, mm -hmm. but we will see uh, later on that uh, this notion may show up again very soon. All right, so, um, so let's talk about how we think of passive learning, but a little bit from a theoretical perspective. It's not just like we, hey, we collect training data, we, we train something, right? Um, so the way we formalize this is to say, uh, learning happens between the environment, which essentially holds everything I just discussed, in particular that, uh, uh, that uh, little h star and, uh, um, and the learner. <clears throat> so the environment, uh, in standard passive learning is described by not H star itself, but a joint distribution P over the X, Y space. Okay, so it's a joint distribution. So for example, I'm just making a, a very concrete example here. Um, let's assume that PX, here X is our natural numbers, uh, is this geometric distribution uh, by some parameter lambda. So the way we think of it is like, hey, this puts more probability on the natural number one and less probability on two and so on and so forth. It decays, but it puts something that's normalized over all natural numbers. And uh, we can define the joint by you know, the product of Px and the condition of Py given x. So in this case, let me define that Py given x to be a very sharp distribution. So uh, it is given x, it puts, uh, it has a, it's a distribution over y's, right? So zero or one it puts all probability mass on the correct label. So that's the indicator of you know, y equals h star x. So this is a very nice situation. We have an underlying distribution that's sharp, uh, but x is somehow not uniform, it's decay. Okay. Um, in reality, for most machine learning problems, the py given x part is not going to be this sharp. It's going to be uh, for multi-class problems. It is going to be a multinomial distribution uh, that's not concentrated. Uh, so we will have label noise. We will come back to that. All right. So, but assuming I have some joint uh, p x y representing the environment, then what happens is we assume it's the environment who draws a training set, and I'm going to call that training set uh, capital S. The training set is just n. ID samples drawn from the joint PXY. Okay, uh, so let's let's think what this might uh, mean, right? So let's let's look at the following example. So let's say we have the threshold uh, hypothesis space, and uh, H star is this H twenty twenty one. All right, so it's realizable. We actually have it. Let's say n the training set size, the size of S is modest. It's not like millions, but think of it like maybe hundreds. Okay, so um, because our Px is specially designed, it's like geometrically decaying, uh, we should expect that uh, quite often our S does not contain in the beginning of natural numbers. Okay, so just for the sake of argument, let's say in your whole training set of you know, n items, the maximum value of x that we have ever seen is 100. 
Now that means because of uh, our PY given X definition, it's a clear label, right? So all our labels are going to be zero because the, the maximum X did not pass the threshold 2021. Okay, so you get a training set of size N, everything is negatively labeled. Okay, and that's it. That's the training set you are supposed to work with as a learner, right? So the learner now receives this training set S. Now the learner has that hypothesis space capital H and it must select some H hat uh, and that's the learned model from the uh, hypothesis space. Now, what's the principle of doing it, right? So the thing I want to emphasize is, you know, this training set S is in one sense, maybe okay, but in another sense, quite weird because it really doesn't tell you where the threshold starts. You have no information that uh, the, the threshold is at 2021 because you don't see any positive example. So for all we know, given this training set with all negative labels, the learner could very well pick H hat to be just H101, which you know put the threshold at 101 because then it will classify everything in the training set correctly. But you might say that, well, this is not good because um, H101 is far, far away from H2021. Okay, that you are correct. If what we're measuring is uh, the notion of, hey, somehow uh, where the, the distance between thresholds, okay. But on the other hand, this is a tall order. Uh, this is not what machine learning can do for us. In fact, machine learning is uh, aiming for a much lower bar. Okay, it is only looking for something that has small risk. So let's let's look at that, and that's why machine learning is solvable. So what are we care care about, right? What do we care about? Um, to define that, let me first introduce the notion of a loss function. So this loss function L is a function uh, over a pair of labels y and y prime. Um, the most commonly used loss in learning theory is the so-called zero one loss. That's very simple. It just counts. It just looks uh, if y equals y prime or not. If they differ, you incur a loss of one. Otherwise, uh, you incur a loss of zero. Okay. Now, with that, we can define what machine learning truly cares about. It cares about the risk or the true risk, and this risk is called R, uh, R of a hypothesis H. It is defined to be an expectation over P. That means we draw X, Y pairs from P. And the way you think of it is like, this is a test item. X, Y is a test item. It's draw from P again, just like the training items. And with X, Y, you apply your little h to it to make hx is your predicted label. You compare it against the label y you generated and you apply that loss function. So if it's zero one loss, it's just like saying, hey, did your little h classify x correctly as the given label y, okay? Uh, if not, you incur uh, one here and then you take the expectation. That's just the probability of your little h making a mistake, okay? So, um, so that's the risk we care about. Now, how this risk uh, relates to, uh, to you know, uh, it ties the joint distribution PXY that the environment has to that, that H star. Uh, technically, H star is going to be the art mean of all possible hypotheses. Now, this includes things in or outside of your specific hypothesis space. Okay, so it has all this. Um, uh, hypothesis it goes over them and find a minimizer okay, of that risk. So H star is really the uh, risk minimizer. Unfortunately, this is potentially outside of your model family. Okay, so that's the agnostic case, right? So for realizable case, we have the assurance that H star is indeed inside our model family. Okay, now the learner's goal, of course, is to eventually try to minimize RH or hopefully try to do that. But um, it really cannot do that uh, because it doesn't see the underlying distribution P. It only sees a Monte Carlo sample, right? So a training set of size N drawn from P. So that, uh, that's the fundamental uh, difficulty of machine learning, okay? Um, but I also want to say that uh, because our goal is now cast as minimizing risk. So if I'm the learner, I learn some little h hat, I would be happy if R of little h hat is small, okay? 
but I, I don't necessarily aim for h little, little h hat equals h star. Uh, that was what I, I uh, mentioned previously. Okay. Furthermore, uh, we all know in machine learning, we have like, hey, you should train, but then you should evaluate on a separate test set, right? So a test set error is nothing but a Monte Carlo estimate of the true risk R because a test set is nothing but another ID sample drawn from P. Okay, so that's how it relates. So from here on, we will be uh, thinking of this true risk. Now, that's of course uh, behind the scene in a way because this true risk involves expectation under P, which is inaccessible to the learner. So the learner having only ending set S what it can realistically compute is something called the empirical risk, or this is nothing but training set error when you have zero one loss. Um, this is denoted as R hat. So in this part of the tutorial, this hat notion is quite important and uh, it's flying everywhere. So I want to make sure people are happy with it. R without hat is the true risk. R with a hat is with respect to the empirical distribution on S, right? So that's just summing over your training set, what's the loss? So as we can see, this R hat is again, a Monte Carlo estimate of R. Okay, so that's the setup so far. Now, now we can finally come to like, how should we do machine learning, right? In theoretical machine learning, the way you do learning is very simple. You do it by something called empirical risk minimization. Okay. This is not the only way, by the way, but this is the basic way to analyze algorithms. Um, what is it? It's literally just uh, the middle equation. Here's what the learner is doing. It's called ERM. Um, it is trying to find a little h within the family of hypotheses available to the learner, such as our linear threshold uh, hypothesis family. And uh, uh, it's trying to simply minimize the empirical risk. Okay, so just literally minimizing training set error. Okay. Um, now, whenever we have argmin, uh, recall argmin really is a set, right? So it's the set of hypotheses in your hypothesis family that will minimize our hat. In, in general, that set uh, may contain multiple hypotheses. So in fact, in our example, when you have a training set uh, S uh, whose largest item is 100, while the true threshold is 2021, we will have a whole bunch of, of um, uh, 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 hypotheses in that argument set, H101, H102, et cetera, et cetera. These are all valid empirical risk minimizers. And we do not specify how the learner would choose one out of them. So the assumption is the learner is just going to arbitrarily choose any one of them. That's it. It costs learning down, right? So it chooses a member in the argument set. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, so maybe I should just pause quickly and see if there are any questions or comments. I don't see any questions in the Q and A or chat. Okay. Great. Uh, please do post something if uh, anything becomes unclear. All right, so now you might object to what I'm doing here because this screams like overfitting, right? So I'm, I'm really minimizing training set error. And isn't that just the best thing we were taught to do to not to do in machine learning 101? And you would be right in some sense, but um, we will see. So what is overfitting? Uh, so unfortunately, overfitting is actually not a technical term. It can mean a whole bunch of things. Uh, the, the most usual sense is R, the true risk of H hat, what your learner learned through ERM, is much greater than R hat, which is the training set error of your classifier. So that's the most usual sense. It's like, hey, I trained my uh, model. It looks great on my training set. But when I apply it on the test set, it suddenly has a huge error, right? So that's the first sense. Uh, but you could also uh, use overfitting to mean uh, several different things. Like the second one is the true risk of what your model is, is much bigger than what could you ever get the best thing you could get h star um, okay 
if that's much bigger, that's another sense of overfitting. The third sense is, well, you cannot literally compare to the H star, the best possible one. Uh, maybe it's uh, the best one. How about the best one in your model family that's accessible to you? Okay, so it could be that your H hat is uh, is not so good. Um, even though it's good on training set, the true risk is much higher than what you could have chosen as the best threshold. And this is already showing up, right? We we sort of see that uh, if we choose H one hundred one that has zero training set error, but it will have some uh, true error. And uh, it is not as good as the infimum here, which would be H2021. Uh, okay. So uh, what machine learning wants to do is to carefully quantify these differences. And one way to do that is to, uh, you know, let's conceptually think how we should describe that RH hat, the error of something that you trained on, uh, you, you uh, obtained from training, the true risk of that. And the way you uh, decompose it is you can just literally introduce and cancel out terms to break it down into three parts. So these are known as uh, estimation error, approximation error, and Bayes error. Now, uh, you don't have to stare at the formula. Let's look at that example. Um, so let's uh, take our hypothesis space to be, again, natural numbers, threshold function. Okay, threshold can be at any place. But let's take H star to be outside my family, right? So it puts a zero at the second location, but otherwise it's all zero, okay? Now, with that, let's start from the base error part. The base error is introduced when the environment has a conditional distribution py given x, that is not concentrated. That just means it's not a one-hot vector. It doesn't, with probability one, give you the correct label. It may have, say, an epsilon uh, corruption. So whenever you uh, have X with some probability epsilon, it will actually show you the opposite label. Okay, But with one minus epsilon, it's still going to give you the correct label. So this is what uh, is known as, like, in the, in the uh, base optimum classifier sense, you should still be able to recover H star but now you incur on the on training set or on test set, you will incur that epsilon noise. That is not avoidable because the world is just putting some noise there. Okay, so this is unavoidable. It's known as Bayes error. It's kind of like the floor. Uh, okay, so that's that. On top of that, the second component is known as approximation error. You can literally think of this as, uh, you know, this is a model error of your hypothesis family or hypothesis space capital H. Uh, our capital H is all threshold classifiers, so it literally does not include H star. Okay, and that's um, that's the that's the nature of the error. So we're simply looking at the error incurred by the closest family, uh, closest member H prime in your family. And in this case, if our px is geometrically decreasing, you can show that uh, h1 would be the closest member in your hypothesis family to that h star, okay? Because that's the zero there. Uh, uh, you can you can verify like h2, which would be like zero one blah blah, it will make two mistakes, and so it has higher error, and so on and so forth. Okay, so this part of the error is due to, as we were saying, misspecification of your hypothesis family. Okay, uh, we will come back to this, but uh, short answer is this is not something machine learning theory has focused on. People pretty much view this as a modeling issue and uh, you know, kind of like an engineering, hand engineering issue that one need to construct that capital H carefully. The third source of error is estimation error. And this comes from the fact that you don't see the underlying P, but you just see a uh, sample S of size N, draw ID from that P, okay? Uh, so there's S by itself is a random variable. Uh, so you should expect to see, you know, a variety of training sets. In our example, uh, let's say occasionally, it's plausible that your S training set may contain uh, uh, you know, the second item x equals two and it's correct label, zero there. 
uh, and it may contain x equals three and so on. But let's say it does not contain x equals one. Okay, so your learner would not know the label of x equals one. Okay, given that training set, if you uh, work out the ERM, it's going to actually pick uh, H3 as the minimum risk classifier, ERM. Okay. Um, why? Well, because it doesn't have a representative training set. It doesn't know that uh, X1 should be classified as one. Okay. So that is the error that is, um, if you look at it, uh, look at the top line on the screen, the estimation area is really defined as comparing with the best in the family, but in terms of the true risk, right? So we know H3, in fact, will have a higher risk than H1. H1 is the closest in family, okay? So this is something that we can handle. This is something that uh, as intuitively you can avoid if you increase your training set size then you will likely see x equals one in your training set and you will not pick x h3, you will pick h1 instead, okay? So this is the uh, error decomposition. And uh, in fact, uh, classic machine learning theory only concerns about estimation error. It does not concern about base error or approximation error. It just says, how should I try to reduce my estimation error? Okay, and this is coming up. And this is the famous, uh, probably approximately correct guarantee or PAC guarantee. Uh, for the sake of uh, simplicity, I'm going to assume that uh, for now, that our hypothesis family is finite. Now, that's not in my example. My example has that being all threshold functions uh, over natural numbers. But let's, for example, assume uh, I truncate it. So my hypothesis family stops at some large threshold. Assume that. Now the theorem itself is stated in the following way. It says um, the probability over S, over training sets, is going to be large enough or uh, greater than one minus delta. So that just says very likely you will get a training set S with the property stated inside the bracket. Okay. Um, that really is just like saying, hey, you will not receive a very strange training set, okay? Uh, so what is the property? The property is uh, if you perform ERM on that training set, you get a little h hat, you look at its true risk, which you don't know, but uh, we guarantee you the true risk R of h hat is not too far away from what you, what the best member in your family. Okay, so the infimum over the best threshold function that you could have chosen if you knew the whole uh, R, uh, sorry, the whole P distribution, um, that is bounded. And it's bounded by this complex looking uh, term. Uh, the most salient feature I want to point out though is it is one over square root N, where N we recall is the size of your training set, okay? So this pack guarantee essentially says your estimation error is not too large. It is upper bounded by one over square root n. That means if you have big data, if n is large, then your estimation error uh, really is very close to zero. Uh, so that's one main message. The other message is um, the hypothesis space size of capital H uh, enters the picture through a log term. So we can tolerate exponential sized hypothesis space, uh, but cannot tolerate infinite hypothesis. Okay, so that's that. Now, um, one, one thing I want to point out is this is a general pack guarantee for uh, agnostic case, meaning that uh, our hypothesis family may not contain the true uh, H star. Uh, it turns out if you are in a luckier uh, realizable case, you can sharpen this to one over n. That's much faster than one over square root n. So in the realizable case, uh, estimation area is even more favorable. Okay, but as we uh, mentioned before, 
uh, pack learning guarantee really doesn't control anything about approximation error or uh, Bayes error. So in other words, at the end of the day, your R of H hat could still be quite large, could be, you know, 50% error or something like that. Uh, and you would have no control over that. All you have guaranteed is your estimation error is close to zero, but uh, it doesn't mean you get a good classifier in, in any sense. All right, so um, let's see. Uh, I think I'm going to skip like uh, how we get to that uh, interesting conclusion, but uh, it's really uh, an application of concentration of measures, uh, making sure that because all those training set is just a Monte Carlo estimate of the true risk, that's the thing you utilize with the slight complication that you are using that training set both to do Monte Carlo estimate and to pick your ERM uh, uh, classifier or ERM hypothesis. That complicates things. So we have to apply union bound to get uniform convergence. Okay, so, but that's, that, that's where that uh, size of uh, capital H comes into picture. I'm happy to uh, discuss this offline. Or Sanj, do you think I guess it's okay. We so I think we can go on. Okay. All right. So uh, now, uh, recall that the the pack bound I gave you only applies to uh, finite hypothesis. But even in my simple example earlier, my hypothesis space is already this uh, infinite uh, threshold function, right? So intuitively. Even though this is an infinite hypothesis space, it's really not that complicated. And we should be able to learn in the sense of uh, guaranteeing estimation error. And the problem really is we used the union bound on the previous page, which is too weak for our situation. So um, this uh, VC dimension is essentially the crown jewel of uh, classic learning theory it precisely characterizes uh, which hypothesis space are learnable and which are not. The conclusion is if you have a finite VC dimension, uh, you are learnable in the sense that your estimation error is bounded. Okay. So what is VC dimension of a hypothesis family? Uh, it's a mouthful, so let me read this. It's the size T of the largest set. Uh, this is the set of input items, Xi1 to Xit. If you can find, uh, you know, essentially t different input items, such that they can be assigned all possible combination of labels by your hypothesis space, this is known as shattering. Then that t is the VC dimension. You look for one such largest set, and the size of that set is the VC dimension. So let's look at an example. Uh, take our hypothesis space of you know, all threshold functions. Let's try t equals one. Uh, t equals one uh, is trivial. You can pick any item, in particular the first item, x equals one, and say, oh yeah, I have all two possible labelings. Uh, the, it's going to be x equals one is going to be labeled as zero by my second hypothesis, h2. It's going to be labeled as one by the first hypothesis. Okay. So uh, I can find a set of size one that is shattered. What about uh, t equals two, right? So let's try uh, uh, x equals one, x equals two as the two items. Let's see if we can find hypotheses that uh, will shatter them. So it's clear that you know uh, I can get both zero and zero labeling on those two items by just any threshold function with a large threshold. I can get zero one by h two. I can get one one by H one, except that I couldn't find a hypothesis in my capital H that can label X one as uh, one, but X two as zero because my threshold is in the uh, going up direction. And in fact, you can easily prove that uh, it's not a problem with your choice of X one, X two, uh, no pairs can have, uh, can have this kind of labeling. So we failed. 
And that means the largest T uh, that can be shattered is just one. And so our VC dimension in this case is one. Okay. Um, so this is a very interesting uh, combinatorial concept. And it turns out with this, we can sharpen our uh, pack guarantee. The, the one on top is what we saw previously, but stated slightly differently. Uh, that's what finite age. Now the, the new version says, well, you only need finite VC dimension for your hypothesis space. If it's finite, you can replace that log H term with the VC dimension term, okay? And you still get this uh, dependency uh, of one over square root N on the training set size, okay? So because VC dimension is fixed, it's a constant, right? Uh, again, we see that if you have more and more training data, your, uh, your ERM learned classifier H hat will have good uh, um, estimation error. Okay, so that's all there is. Uh, that's all what pack learning is saying. Okay, so we're actually down with, you know, it's a very quick tour of what passive learning uh, has to offer at a very high level. Uh, the story is we get our training set as ID from drawing uh, from this underlying joint distribution PXY. And it, it is the environment who is drawing that data set for us. So the learner has no influence how, on how that data is collected. It's just given that S. For this reason, this is known as passive learning because you know the learner is passively given S and asked to learn from it. It's not actively acquiring data. And uh, that's going to be contrast with immediately with uh, what we will do pretty much for the rest of the talk. Uh, the environment, you can also think of it as not being particularly helpful in the sense that it's kind of neutral. It just has this joint distribution, which could even be noisy and it's just sample ID uh, items from it, right? So it's not super helpful. Uh, what we uh, know is it depends on the learner's hypothesis space H, or in particular, the VC dimension of that uh, capital H. When the VC dimension is finite, there is an estimation error bound uh, on the order of one over square root N. That's all. Um, there's no control over approximation and base error. And I put a footnote here, right? So this is the classic picture about like 10 years ago. And uh, with deep learning, um, people start to realize that uh, to analyze deep learning models, you actually require some additional theory in particular because um, we're not just doing ERM with deep nets. Uh, we're actually using specific algorithms, right? So like, like SGD that you arrive at a particular answer, okay? That algorithm comes into the picture because it implicitly constrains uh, your capital H family. You're not able to reach everything in there. Um, so that brings up some interesting and uh, uh, you know, open questions on how you model that. So uh, it's an active research area. But that's my uh, first part. We will move on to active learning, but let's see if there are any questions or comments. So if there are any questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A. Or uh, for panelists, please un unmute yourself and ask. Any questions? I think we can move ahead with the next uh, part of the talk. All right, so let's move on to active learning. Uh, as many of you know, this is a place where the learner starts to literally play a more active role. Um, just for simplicity, we will assume there's no Bayes error. That just means, you know, the nature doesn't have label noise, okay? If you query X, it's always going to give you H star X as the answer, okay? And uh, we will assume there is no approximation error that the true concept is in your the learner's hypothesis space. Both can be relaxed, but uh, we will do that for simplicity. Okay, so here is the active learning protocol. Um, there is going to be, uh, you know, this capital H again. Uh, the learner possesses that. Um, 
the environment has some H star okay, in that family. Okay, that's the true concept to be learned. Now, um, what's different is, first of all, learning is now sequential. So we have a notion of T that goes uh, from one to up to, you know, whenever you want to stop. Uh, second, uh, the, uh, the world is no longer generating data uh, sampled from the underlying P. Rather, in step two, uh, at time T, the learner is going to look at the whole interaction history so far, including what it has done before, what answers it received from the world. And it decides what query XT to perform. So that's just a fancy name to say, you know, uh, the learner gets to pick an item XT in the input space and pose it as a question to the environment. And in step three, the environment is required to answer truthfully with um, the correct label for that XT. So that forms a pair XT YT, that label is given back to the learner. So from that XTYT pair, the learner is going to update its estimate of the model. Now, because things are sequential, I'm using H hat, but with a subscript T uh, as, a, um, as a way to denote that the learner could change its mind as it sees more uh, examples. Um, there are two flavors of um, querying. Um, one is the learner has the power to just like we call it synthesize or just pick any X in the capital X space. Okay, um, this is very similar to the membership query uh, that's well known uh, in the in the query uh, learning by query uh, type of work. Uh, it's a special case there. Uh, here you can generalize this to uh, arbitrary label space. Okay, so that's one type of uh, uh, query. Uh, but sometimes in, in practice, people don't like it because um, if you think of a feature representation uh, like our usual feature space X, it's actually fairly hard to for the learner to, to construct or synthesize a little X that will make sense to the Oracle, which usually are human experts. Like in the, in the case of uh, images, it's hard if your image is represented in the pixel feature space, it's hard for the learner to guarantee that an X actually makes visual sense to a human uh, uh, oracle. So for that reason, uh, there's a different way to generate this query. And this assumes that the environment still has a marginal distribution on X. Remember the PY given X part is fixed, it's clear, but PX is um, a distribution that the environment possesses. For example, distribution over natural images. And here in step two, there is an inner loop. The learner basically keeps drawing uh, from that uh, uh, marginal distribution, like just give me an unlabeled image, give me another unlabeled image, until it is happy with the X it received. It decides to use an, uh, that X as XT. Okay. This interaction assumes uh, drawing from the unlabeled distribution uh, incurs no cost. So the only cost that we are concerned here is how many labels we ask in step three. Okay, so only about queries, uh, drawing things does not incur anything. Okay. Uh, Jerry, there's a question in the chat about okay. what's an example of an oracle? Right. So, so an oracle, I guess, yeah. Yeah, an oracle literally uh, in, the, in the usual machine learning sense, an oracle literally is a human annotator. And uh, this is the case for, say, image classification, right? So you have, uh, you, have a, you, you suddenly need to create a data set, uh, classifier for cats versus dogs, but assuming you don't have any training set. So what you might be doing is you uh, do number two, you pick a natural image XT, a photo of something, you give it to a human annotator like crowdsourcer, right? So you give it to that annotator and say, hey, please tell me the correct label for this photo. That's going to be YT. And uh, we assume the human annotator, in their mind, they have that H star. So they are able to perform that labeling for you. They can evaluate H star XT for you and they will give you back YT. So that's the usual assumption. Uh, 
All right, so let's let's look at a stylized example, not cats versus dogs. I wish I could do that, but this is much simpler. Um, and it's very similar to our uh, earlier example, except that I made x continuous and uh, it's bounded between 0 and 1. So our input space is just the interval between 0 and 1 real numbers. Let's say px is uniform over that. Okay, So y is, again, binary. right? Now, um, I'm going to define uh, threshold functions. It's, again, th step up threshold function. So left is going to be uh, 0 class, right uh, 1 class. Uh, it's defined by a threshold little a. That little a is between 0 and 1. Okay, So that's our little h a. My hypothesis space is going to be all these step up threshold functions with you know, a uh, in 0, 1. Right? So it's an infinite collection of those. We assume that there is a true h star, which is a true threshold function uh, with the special threshold a star somewhere. We don't know. Okay. Um, and our job is to find uh, that h star or you know, have an estimate of h hat t that's close to h star. Now, if you think about our active learning protocol, you immediately see that, aha, this is nothing but binary search. Or rather, I could do binary search on this problem. right? So I'm going to, as an active learner, knowing that this space is 0, 1, I'm going to first query x1 equals half. And the world has to, uh, the oracle has to give me the correct label, depending on uh, the which side uh, a star is. Okay. Um, Knowing the true label, what it helps me is it really helps me throw away half of my hypothesis space. It's either uh, the left half between zero and half is the threshold cannot be there, or the other half, my threshold cannot be there. Okay, so that's the first query, right? So knowing that, I know the answer. I, I cut off half of my um, hypothesis space. Next query is going to to be the midpoint of the surviving uh, half. Okay. And uh, again, we, I can cut off uh, half of that, so one fourth of the original space, and so on and so forth, right? So if your A star is like a generic real number, um, you don't expect your binary search to ever hit it exactly. However, what you can guarantee is your threshold, uh, well, rather the surviving hypothesis space is, is cut down by half after each query. Okay, so that's what you can guarantee. And uh, if you were to stop at any moment and to say, hey, what did you learn? You could, as a learner, arbitrarily pick a hypothesis as threshold from the surviving interval. Okay, so let's look at that, right? Uh, as we were saying, after n active queries, the interval, of course, by binary search uh, has length 1 over 2 to the nth. And um, with no good reason to decide which one of the threshold within the interval is the best, let's assume the learner is going to you know, pick an arbitrary h hat t. Now, what's the risk? Um, because our px is uniform, it's not hard to show that the true risk of what you learn at this stage uh, is upper bounded. Oh, I should, uh, sorry, um, this should be h hat n uh, is upper bounded by 1 over 2 to the nth. Okay. Um, so it's small. It's actually uh, exponentially decreasing, right? So the way you compare it against the, the original thing uh, that we said in passive learning, there we bounded uh, estimation error at the rate of 1 over n. That, that's because it's a realizable case. And because of our assumptions, uh, there's no base error. There is no approximation error. So this is literally the risk. So in the passive learning case, you can get a rate of uh, 1 over n. And that's also intuitive. The way you think of it is, like with a uniform px distribution, if you were to draw n items id, they are roughly speaking, uh, you know, on a regular grid between zero and one with those n items. Therefore, the uh, the uncertainty interval, the surviving interval, uh, is going to be of size one over n. Okay, so that's a much wider interval than what you would get 
with active learning here. Um, Jerry, there's a clarification question. Mm -hmm. uh, why is the exponential bound only an upper bound? Because you could get lucky, right? You could, uh, oh, do you mean why it's not a lower bound? You could get lucky, like you just guessed an H hat T that happens to hit the thresh, uh, the truth threshold. Is that, uh, I, I don't know if this answers the question. Um, let's see. Yes, the questioner says it does. Thanks. Okay, thanks. All right, so now we see a huge improvement, right? It's like, okay, with active learning, you can learn a lot faster. However, uh, this only applies to the very special case of, you know, this 1D threshold over an interval and we are using binary search. We know how to do that. The question is, can you generalize this? Can you generalize this to arbitrary um, hypothesis space, not just intervals? Um, to do that, we need to uh, introduce two concepts. One is the notion of version space. I have already saying that, been saying that for a while. A version space V is simply a subset of my hypothesis space that agrees with all data so far. So in other words, that's the surviving interval of thresholds, okay? In general though, for a non-threshold problem, you can still define uh, the version space. It's any hypothesis that survived all the data, uh, uh, the labeled data that you have seen so far. Okay, so that's the version space. On top of that version space, there is the notion of a disagreement region induced by a version space. So a version space is a subset of hypothesis, a subset of classifiers. But a disagreement region is a subset of the input space. It's the part of the input where your version space is still disagreeing on, okay? So in other words, you have a version space, if it's very small, like a small interval, uh, many part of the X, your version space would completely agree upon, okay? Uh, because, you know, they're, they, every classifier in your version space would classify that point as a negative point. Um, while um, disagreement region is, uh, as we said here, uh, the part of X space where there exists two hypotheses in your version space that disagree on how it should classify that. Okay. All right. So with this, I'm going to introduce a very simple algorithm that generalizes uh, active learning to uh, to at least the nice case, uh, nice case being hypothesis space again is finite. And our true target H star is in the hypothesis space. It's realizable, okay? So what do we do by this? This is a algorithm that maintains a version space, right? So it's just like what we uh, saw earlier. It maintains the, um, the interval of possible thresholds. You initialize that version space V by the whole hypothesis space. Now, um, step two is kind of interesting. You look if your current version space induces a disagreement region, right? So part of the X space. In the beginning, very likely it's the whole X space. And you, you see what, it, what uh, marginal probability the world puts on that disagreement region. Is it bigger than epsilon or not? In the beginning, it's going to be yes. So you enter the loop. What are you doing there, right? You um, <clears throat> you keep drawing x from the underlying px. So this is easy. This is the unlabeled query that we already saw. You can ask the world, hey, Google me another photo, Google me another photo, something like that without knowing the true label, okay? But what you do is you want to accumulate k such points that are in the disagreement region of your current version space that you can check as a learner. You maintain your version space, so you can you know, make sure you have K points that's in there. What is implicit here is you also reject potentially a very large number of X points that your current version space agrees on. And this is actually the power of active learning. Okay, you are focusing your labeled effort on points that uh, are still disagreed upon. 
Okay, so that's that's where the hidden power is. So once you have k points, you're going to simply ask the Oracle to label all these k points all at once. Okay, so you get a mini batch of k labeled training items. Then you update your version space in step five. So that's also very simple. You just cut off any uh, hypothesis that disagrees with this new batch of points. So you maintain you know, points that uh, are perfectly in agreement so far. So this reduces your V size, right? So then you keep doing that, okay. Um, that's the algorithm, it's very simple. Uh, now, technically, what does it do? The way you can think of this is if you have the right amount of k, if you set k correctly, then after querying these k disagreeing points, you are going to reduce your version space sufficiently. And sufficiently is in, in a special sense. It's in the se a particular sense of radius. But uh, we don't have to go into that. The intuition is you reduce your version space guaranteed by a constant fraction, in this case, half. And because of that, this becomes essentially a generalization of binary search. Okay, And uh, then we have a somewhat scary looking theorem. Uh, the theorem says, if you set k to be this quantity, which is two times a mysterious quantity called theta, we will come back to that, times log hypothesis over delta log log one over epsilon. Right? So this is uh, the way, best way to think of it is like, ah, it's like kind of a theta-ish quantity. Okay, so big old theta-ish, ignoring log factors. Then you're going to uh, terminate and uh, you will have a guaranteed uh, uh, learned model that is epsilon good to risk, nice. The total number of labeled queries you have to do in step three, if you add up all these thresholds, it's, uh, it, it's kind of like um, this big O term in there, right? So let me break it down into, you know, really three parts. The first, first part is uh, log one over epsilon, where epsilon here is your desired accuracy, okay? Log one over epsilon is always good, okay? So um, you basically, if you equate um, N, the number of total queries, to this log of one over epsilon, you see that the risk is uh, decreasing exponentially. It's one over e to the nth, right? So big O of that. So it's it's uh, exponential. It's better than uh, passive learning. The second term is this theta in there. So okay, that that says you know theta better be a smallish quantity. Okay, it should not be infinity, at least. Then the third term is some log, log, log terms. So let's ignore that for now, okay? So what we have seen here is, um, yeah, this seems to be working, except that we don't know what that theta is and that we want that theta to be small. Jerry, there's a question on the Q&A. Yep. Uh, the question is, can the Cal algorithm be framed as greedily maximizing information gain? Aha. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, not directly, uh, simply because this is, uh, well, um, uh, I, I, yeah, okay, so longer discussion, but I, I don't think it is directly maximizing information gain because it really is uh, very simple, right? So the, you pick a query simply because at least two surviving hypotheses disagree on its uh, classification. Okay, so we're not really trying to work too hard. We're not trying to say this maximizes some notion of either uncertainty or information gain. Okay, we're still relying on PX and it's actually PX, you know, you, you do kind of a rejection sampling, right? So this is a much more relaxed version than uh, the kind of active learning information gain type of criteria. And what's amazing is we can still give theoretical guarantees. Mm -hmm. I also saw a raised hand from uh, Noreen, I think. Is there a question? Okay, and then a question for Raj Bodek in the chat. For what classes of H is uh, DIS of V computable? Ah, uh, excellent question. So uh, for for the classes that's of interest to 
u, I assume it's hard to compute. Okay, so this v is already hard. Uh, and uh, there is something else that I'm getting to. So sorry, not to answer your question directly. We only know how to compute this. this well, this v is easy to define, but what family is computationally, uh, you know, cheap to compute? Uh, the active learning community do not pay enough attention to that question. Sorry. Thank um, you, yeah, sure. But let me also point out, now let's come back to this theta. The theta is going to be a bigger problem. Okay, so what is this theta? Theta is defined in a strange way. Okay, this is known as a uh, disagreement coefficient. Um, so let me parse the top equation for you a little bit. Uh, what we do here is uh, imagine we have, uh, imagine the, the first, the um, hypothesis space. We have H star in our hypothesis space. Now imagine you grow a ball around it with some radius R. So what is the distance measure here? It is going to be um, the disagreement, uh, like H X not equal uh, H prime X, the loss function, right? The zero one loss that uh, under P X, the true uh, environment marginal. Okay. So it's their disagreement probability. That's your uh, distance between hypotheses. So and in any ways, you start from H star in the center, grow a ball with radius R. So that's going to circle some number of hypotheses in your hypothesis space. Now you say, hey, on what part of X space do this ball disagree on? So you look at the disagreement region of that. And then finally, you look at the probability of that disagreement region. It's like, hey, is the large part of your input space being disagreed on or not, right? So that's the question here. Now, as we should expect, if I start R from zero or very near zero and I increase R, my ball gets bigger. I have more hypotheses in this ball. So they tend to disagree more and the probability of disagreement region should grow, right? So let's look at the rate of that growth compared against R, the radius, okay? And I take supremum. So anywhere as I grow this ball, what's the largest rate of growth along the way? That is the quantity known as theta, and it's known as disagreement coefficient. Okay, so this may all sound very abstract. Let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, so for 1D threshold functions that we have already seen, um, this ball is actually kind of easy to compute. Uh, you can show it's uh, it's simply the interval around the true threshold with uh, you know plus minus r, okay. And uh, for this reason, the probability of that disagreement region is simply two r, and therefore theta is just two, okay, anywhere, okay. So this is a case where we have a small disagreement coefficient for one-dimensional threshold functions. And that's why my earlier binary search is very successful. Literally, it's like, uh, it's partly explained by having a small theta here. And then what I want to contrast is the second example where my hypothesis space is no longer a threshold function, but rather an interval function still in 1D. So you can imagine this is just in 1D, but the target is defined by some A star B star interval such that Within the interval, everything is classified as say positive and outside the interval, it's classified as negative, right? Okay. So for this hypothesis class, uh, you might say, well, what's the difference? It's like one threshold versus two thresholds, but it has a dramatic effect on the disagreement, disagreement coefficient. Uh, the expression is a little bit ugly to read, but just focus on the inner one over max B star minus A star uh, epsilon term. Rec recall epsilon is the desired precision and the B star minus A star is actually the, uh, the interval length for your target concept that you know, it classifies things as positive, okay? So the difficulty comes when your target concept is just a blip it has a very small B star minus A star. Okay, so it, uh, you know, it's almost everywhere negative except for a tiny interval where B star minus A star is, um, is, uh, uh, is positive, uh, is, you know, sorry, that uh, difference is small. Uh, in particular, if that interval length is 
on the order of your desired epsilon, then this is simply the first term inside the, the max is just one over epsilon, okay? That can be quite large, okay? That can be quite large. And recall this theta, let me go back one slide, right? This theta comes into the, uh, the, the number of queries, you know, as is, as a, as a linear term, okay? So what does it say? Uh, why is one dimensional interval in trouble here? Uh, this is literally an example of uh, what's known as a warm start problem. If you have that target concept with just a blip of positive island, um, without knowing where that little interval is, the active learner actually has no idea, right? It, it, it doesn't know where the positive region is. So what can it do? Well, it cannot do anything. It can only sort of literally do a random uh, you know, randomly query in the beginning until it happened to hit that little island, okay? But that's very expensive. That's already uh, requiring one over epsilon number of items, okay? So this is known as the warm start problem. Once the active learner happens to hit a point inside the target interval, then everything becomes nice because it has one positive item inside. It already presumably have some negative outside. It can do two separate binary searches for the left and right interval. Okay, so after that stage, it's fine. But to, to get a point inside, to get the first positive point is the trouble spot. Okay, and that's reflected here in uh, the disagreement coefficient being large. Finally, I just want to point out uh, for a very studied, very well studied family of problems being, you know, uh, our favorite high dimensional hyperplanes, they are very much like thresholds. So uh, you can show on the mild conditions, the uh, coefficient, the disagreement coefficient is order one. Okay, so they are small. All right. And uh, let me let me wrap up uh, this part. Uh, so the Difference here in active learning is the learner decides what data point to collect xt, right? The environment says what label it is, but the learner decides where to ask the query. Because of that, um, you can design uh, general active learning algorithms that uh, on the favorable conditions of that coefficient, uh, disagreement coefficient, which is a property of your hypothesis space. Uh, on the favorite conditions, you get exponential uh, error bound, which is nice. Okay. Ah, great. So um, let me let me contrast something uh, with I, I know this is uh, of great interest uh, in the synthesis community. Uh, what if active learning use something other than membership query? Remember. What we did previously is essentially a membership query. XT is a membership uh, query. But you could imagine the learner just asks uh, for equivalence query. So the learner at some iteration just says, hey, Oracle, I have this whole hypothesis, little h hat t minus one. Could you please take a look at it and see if I got it or not? Okay, so the interaction is different. The learner asks, the learner exposes its whole hypothesis, little h hat t minus one at that moment to the oracle. The oracle either says, yes, your little h hat t minus one happens to be h star, or no, in that case, the oracle is going to give you a counter example, right? This counter example takes the form of uh, some item x t in the disagreement region between h star and your h hat t minus one, as well as its correct label yt. Okay, so that's the that's the uh, the equivalence query, and the, based on that feedback, the learner estimates um, the updates its estimate. Now, what I want to make a comment for is like this is actually not very well studied in machine learning because for the type of problems people typically care about, like training a deep net uh, to classify cats and dogs, uh, it's actually fairly hard to do equivalence query. 
that would be that would essentially amounts to you know the learner gives the whole current network weights to some oracle and say hey do you think this is the correct network uh, that's pretty hard um, but i want to point out one thing assuming we can do equivalence query uh, in the classic analysis of uh, equivalence queries the counter example xt is assumed to be adversarial meaning that the oracle uh, can pick an arbitrary xt in the disagreement region okay it doesn't have to pick a helpful one okay so for that reason uh, all the analysis literally assumes worst case it assumes xt is the least helpful uh, within the disagreement region okay but there's a difference right so if you assume you can get a more helpful oracle in choosing the counter example for you uh, you can learn things much much faster so let's again take a look at our original example this goes back to the discrete uh, threshold linear threshold function and this time um, I'm going to say the true threshold is at uh, age 2021. Okay, so you have a whole bunch of zeros. The 2021st uh, X item will get positive label and so on and so forth. Okay, now let's say we do equivalence queries, right? Uh, you can imagine uh, 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 the least helpful oracle with an interaction could go like this, where the learner says, hey, I guess uh, H had to be, you know, H1, my put threshold at first place. Is this the correct hypothesis? And the Oracle says, no, but I will give you a counter example. Uh, look at X equals one, I would classify it as zero. You, you said it's one, I'm going to say it's zero, right? Now, nothing prevents the learner from saying, oh, well, then I should guess H hat equals uh, what we call H2, uh, where, you know, you put zero in the first place and one afterwards. The oracle will say, well, no, that's not what I have in mind. Look at location x equals two, I classify it as zero and so on and so forth, right? So it's going to go on like this for a while. And this is essentially what's assumed uh, in uh, equivalence queries. Uh, the, um, there's, uh, there's no assumption on the, uh, on the uh, counter example. So we should assume worst case. While um, in the most helpful case if you have an oracle that really is there to help you when you ask well is uh i have this um h hat being you know little h1 is this right the answer could be no um look my counter example is x at 2020 that one i classified as zero now by this the learner should immediately exclude everything every uh, little h with threshold before 2020 uh, it doesn't of course doesn't prevent uh, the learner to do something crazy in the next step like oh how about this uh, new age that puts a threshold at a really large number and the uh, oracle would still say no right but uh, this time uh, it will be helpful and given counter example at 2021 and say I, I give you a label one there so with just two iterations of uh, uh, interaction uh, we should have a learner that precisely learned h star in this case and this is an example, a segue for me to uh, discuss something uh, we call machine teaching. Uh, Jerry, I, I think uh, this may be a good point to take a few minute break. So uh, why don't we take a four minute break and then resume at uh, uh, 55 past the hour. So 9.55 Pacific. Um, in the meantime, uh, there is a question on the chat from Raz Bodic, and there may be other questions as well. So we could take those okay. uh, for those people that hang on. So, uh, so Raz's question is related to the warm start problem. Mm -hmm. So he so he writes uh, regarding the warm start problem. Could you define a new kind of label slash query to the oracle? For example, is the target interval inside some guest interval? Aha. Um, Maybe to bro put a broader perspective, you know, the the learner is essentially using uh, guiding the search right by the knowledge of age. 
Uh, so in some sense, that algorithm is very specific to H. Yep. Yet the protocol for asking the query to the Oracle is fixed and general, right? So one would want to maybe change that query to the Oracle as well, together with H. I, I think that's an excellent uh, point. Uh, it is not how it is done in the, as you know, in the classic active learning, simply because uh, there is a fixed notion that, you know, a query can only be about membership query. That's the machine learning mental uh, mentality there, right? But I, I, su I suspect what you're suggesting is kind of similar to uh, uh, equivalence query. Yes, I can see that, right? An over approximation of such, right? Yeah, you, you could say, you know, uh, I give you, a, as a learner, I give you a bigger interval. We're, we're actually, for, for that matter, any interval, right? But I can query intervals. And uh, uh, you just tell me if it's right, or just give me a, a, a different a, 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 an example, counter example in the disagreement region, which corresponds to in the classic literature. This is the symmetric difference between uh, the H star and uh, the learner's current hypothesis. Yeah, so I think. think that, yeah, if you do that, uh, uh, you should be able to learn much better. Yeah, and I think in the in the literature, I think that there is some work on in the classic query based learning literature. There's some work on subset queries and superset queries. I think that's that's what this particular one belongs yeah, to. Yeah, 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 true. Okay, um, we still have two minutes before the the resumption point. So, uh, if there are no other questions. We can take a true break. Okay. So Jerry, I, I think given that we have just about 35 minutes left, uh, you may not be able to finish all of the, the topics in the tutorial. Um, so uh, I, I do think machine teaching is, is super relevant. And then you might have to pick from the remaining ones based on the time available. Let's, let's do that. Uh, I will adapt. Yeah, thanks. Okay, great. Uh, it's a bit of a pity. I mean, if you if you do have the bandwidth later, it would be nice if you can record the, the sort of the remainder of the tutorial and we'll make it available to the attendees. That's a good suggestion. Yeah, I mean, Thank there's you. always like too many good materials to talk about. And I also don't know uh, which one of them is directly of interest and which ones may stimulate some, you know, uh, not developed yet uh, interactions between the communities. So that's why I was trying to cram a lot of things in there. Yeah, I do think machine teaching is, is, is really, really, really relevant. So um, I, we're now at, at 56 past the hour. So let's get started again. All right. OK, so, um, so, so let's talk about teaching, right? So this is a very uh, different notion uh, than machine learning. Uh, the mentality is completely different. We're no longer uh, in the business of learning a model from data generated by the world. Instead, uh, we are in the world of there is a teacher. 
and the teacher already has a target model. Maybe it's a well-trained network. Maybe the teacher just knows things. So the teacher has a model like H star. And uh, um, maybe the teacher knows something about the learner. Uh, so this could be uh, you know, the learner's actual algorithm uh, or some guarantees that the learner has. Uh, in that sense, the question is, well, can the teacher somehow give H star to the learner? Now, except that you're not allowed to directly give H star to the learner. Uh, you, for example, for when the learner is human kids, you cannot just burn a model H star in their brain. Okay, so that is not allowed. What you can do is you can produce data uh, in the form of, again, here we have uh, labeled training set S, but now I'm going to call it teaching set. Uh, maybe it has n items. All we say is these items are from you know, the correct x, y space, but we no longer have any pxy notion. We're, we're not saying this s has to be ID sampled from something. The teacher has the power to construct them. Okay. Now, the learner is a standard learner. Okay. So it receives this train, uh, teaching set, and it's going to proceed as if it's a standard training set. It's going to select a model or learn a model little h hat from its hypothesis space. Okay. Now the teacher's goal here is to number one make the learner learn, so it will make sure that h hat is h star. Okay. But at the same time, uh, the teacher wants to minimize the size of the teaching set. Okay. So that's the teaching set. Uh, let's look at uh, some examples. Um, you know, the, um, the issue here is let's take the learner to be the consistent or ERM type of learner. That actually literally means the learner maintains a version space that is produced by any teaching set S, right? If you give the learner an S, the learner is going to remove all, um, you know, high empirical risk uh, hypothesis, and uh, there's uh, this equivalent argmax set, right? So that's the version space. And the learner can pick any one H hat uh, from that version space. Um, now, what we want to say is, let's define S more precisely, right? What is a teaching set? S is called a teaching set for the target concept little h star, but with respect to the student's hypothesis space capital H. If by using S, the teacher can eliminate all hypotheses in the student's mind except for little h star. Okay, so that's the requirement. Um, now, of course, so let's look at the example down there. So here I have, again, our threshold functions. Uh, and let's say the teacher says, OK, I want to teach you uh, H2021, right? Now, the training set as that has two items, 2020 label 0, 2021 label 1, with respect to the hypothesis class is going to be a teaching set because it excludes all other hypotheses from capital H. But you can imagine just you can add any consistent data items to S. That's still going to be a teaching set. Okay, so that's the concept. Now we define teaching dimension uh, for my concept little h star with respect to capital H as simply the size of the smallest teaching set S. So. Um, that's the second to bottom line on the screen. What is interesting here is if you think about that, if your H star is H 2021, you need two items in your teaching set. And in fact, that is true for any threshold uh, that's bigger than two, okay? But for little H one, which is like all, the, all ones, right? If that is your target, you only need one item. And because you can show x1 is labeled as 1, no other hypothesis can label x1 as 1. Okay, so you already exclude everything else. Okay, so we can see that you know, there can be variance or the uh, differences in what's the teaching set size. 
and we will finally define teaching dimension of the whole hypothesis with, uh, without regarding to which one is your target, uh, H star, not just as a maximum over all possible target little h stars. Okay, so in our case, for our uh, threshold hypothesis class, the teaching dimension will be two. Okay, so here's a, um, a very uh, concrete example again. What you're seeing here is uh, the columns are items. Now, this is a finite domain. It's not our infinite domain. So let's imagine we have n distinct items. The rows are different hypotheses in the hypothesis space. Uh, the structure here is very simple. You have basically a one hot concept family. Uh, it's one for one of the items zero everywhere else, except for H zero, which is all zeros. Okay, so let's now think of, you know, what is the teaching dimension for this family? To teach little h1 is easy. As a teacher, I only need to show uh, item x1 together with a positive label, label one, okay? Because that's the only, h1 is the only hypothesis that labels uh, x1 as one. Okay, so I only need one item to teach. Same is true for little h2. I only need to say, look, x2 is one. And, and similarly up to hn, right? So all these just need one item. However, in order to teach h0, it's actually not trivial because uh, if I say, hey, x1 is a zero, uh, that only excludes little h1 it still has all other hypotheses surviving, okay? So I also need to say x2 is also one, uh, also, it's also zero, okay? But that doesn't help much, right? Because you still have h3 to hn surviving. So at the end of, end of day, in order to teach little h0, as a teacher, you literally need to enumerate all n items and say all of these are zeros. Okay, so that's why the teaching dimension for this sim like simple looking hypothesis class is actually n, the number of items. That's much, much larger than you would expect. And in fact, uh, for people who are familiar with VC dimension, the VC dimension for this SAM class is just one because you cannot find two, SAM issue, you cannot find two X points that are labeled as you know both one zero and zero one. We don't have that. So it cannot be shattered by, uh, two points cannot be shattered. That's why VC is one. So look at another example here where uh, it's a, same, a very similar structure. We no longer have that all zero hypothesis. Instead, what we have is we have a whole bunch of hypotheses uh, and a whole bunch of input items uh, in the input space. Uh, the structure is as follows. It, let's start from the right-hand side after the dashed line. What there, what, what's there is essentially a truth table for K bits. Okay, so you have two to the k rows, okay? Um, but on the left-hand side, what you have is an indicator. So it's just like uh, the, the left-hand side is actually also two to the k's long, and uh, that is an indicator. Okay, so what we did is we basically did a surgery. We concatenate an indicator on the left with a, a, you know, a full truth table on the right. Okay, the point is to show that the teaching dimension for such a hypothesis class is very simple. It's just one. Why? Because you can use the left-hand side indicator. You can just say, you know, look, x1 is one. Then you uniquely index h1, right? And uh, similarly for all two to the case hypothesis, you can do that. Uh, the point we want to illustrate here is uh, the difference between this and VC dimension. Because we put a truth table inside here, these hypotheses, they can shatter K points, precisely those are the K points on the right-hand side, the K columns on the right-hand side, okay? So the VC dimension will be K, okay? But um, uh, the, the teaching dimension is much, much smaller, okay? Uh, so these are just two interesting examples to illustrate that teaching is really, you know, it's a different beast compared to uh, learning. 
some of the intuitions we develop, some of the theorems we develop for uh, learning no longer applies to uh, characterizing how large is your necessary teaching set. In fact, the precise relation between uh, the minimum teaching set size, teaching dimension, versus uh, uh, you know, the size required for learning that's characterized by VC, that is still a major open question. Um, another way to think of machine teaching is to say, well, this is nothing but a coding problem. As a teacher, I want to convey a message to the student. And the message is simply H star, my target concept. Except that the communication channel is restricted. I can only use the language of labeled training sets okay, or teaching sets. So that's the language is going to be some notion of S, labeled item pairs. And also the decoder in the student is also very special. It is a learning algorithm. Okay. So given that a conceptual way to find the minimum teaching set is simply to solve, pose it as an optimization problem, right? We minimize over training set size, uh, over all training sets, we minimize the training set size subject to this H hat S is just the shorthand that the student takes S produces an H hat subject to that must be H star, okay? Now, uh, this is just a conceptual uh, way to write it. It's actually very hard to solve for several reasons. One is it's a, it's a combinatorial search problem in the space of training sets, S, but also that H hat S in the constraint itself may very well be an optimization problem because that's the machine learning problem. The, the student is taking S and uh, producing an H hat, right? So. Uh, there's a nested lower level optimization. So that makes the whole problem a bi-level optimization problem. So it's not very easy to solve. Um, you could relax this type of problem uh, by, you know, just uh, for, for example, um, uh, relax the cardinality of S by some more general effort function and then relax the uh, equality by saying, okay, I, I only want to do approximate teaching, not exact teaching maybe. And uh, then you can uh, relax that by some notion of distance between what the student learn as H hat from S versus uh, the true uh, H star, okay. But in general, the computation is still uh, difficult in, uh, in this setting. I think there's a question. Yeah, Jerry, there's a question uh, in the Q&A from Marcel. Does the teaching dimension relate to the channel capacity? Um, not that I know of, but I really want to know because uh, posing it as a coding problem, it, it, that is an angle that I don't see the machine learning community analyze the pro problem yet. So that's a, that's a very good question. Okay, so um, here's a short summary. Uh, in the teaching setting, it's all about constructing, the teacher constructing a teaching set, which forces the learner to learn a target H star that's known beforehand, right? And uh, one relevant statement here is, if you can compute the teaching dimension for that H star with respect to the model family uh, capital H, this really uh, lower bounds all uh, sampling based learning. So any learning activity is lower bounded by this, meaning that this is the least amount of training data you would require, okay? Uh, any true learning algorithm will require more than that, okay? Um, another sort of uh, interesting thing to point out is if you contrast teaching dimension in our simple 1D threshold case, with say passive learning, which we know to achieve epsilon error, you need uh, one over epsilon samples. In active learning, you need log one over epsilon, right? So epsilon is let's say 0 0.001. In the passive learning, you need 1000 samples. In active learning, you need 10 samples because you're doing binary search. Uh, teaching would only require two samples, regardless of what precision you want. Okay, so that seems like, a, you know, that's the type of lower bounding we're talking about. But also keep in mind, it is a different 
really a different problem because uh, here the teacher knows H star and just try to communicate this to the student. So that's that. And uh, given that I have only 20 minutes left, I'm going to skip online learning, but I want to uh, give a quick overview of uh, multi-arm bandits and reinforcement learning. So let me actually start with uh, multi-arm bandit. Uh, this is a very interesting setting, which um, it's best to think of it not as, you know, say for classification, but uh, it's some notion of, you know, reward uh, maximization. So the setting is the following. There's an environment which has K distributions, and those are known as K arms. The bandit is really come from the, 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 uh, the gambling machine in the casino, uh, the bandit machine, right? So you have a machine with K arms, and if you pull an arm, you will get a random reward. That's where it starts with. Uh, so there are K arms, each is associated with a reward distribution, capital R. Uh, now we use it for reward, capital R1 to RK. Now, um, this distribution can be, you know, uh, anything that's a reasonably light tail. So it could be a Bernoulli, it could be a Gaussian distribution for each uh, of these uh, rewards. What's important is their mean. So let's assume the means are like mu1 to mu k, okay? Uh, and intuitively, if you play this game long enough, you really should just keep interacting with the arm that has the highest mu, okay? Then you get highest average reward. That's what you are aiming for, okay? Uh, except that you as a learner, you as a bandit learner, you don't know those distributions, you don't know those means, okay? So you have to interact with uh, the machine to figure out, right? So. The interaction protocol is uh, things again go sequentially, and uh, at iteration t, the learner decides on an action, and the action is simply choosing from uh, those k arms which arm to pull. So let's call it a t. That's step three. We're going to pull an arm. Uh, by pulling the arm, the environment is going to generate a reward according to that arm's reward distribution. So the little r t is a random variable. It's sampled from the distribution. Uh, capital RT from that corresponding arm, okay? Um, okay, so that's it, right? Uh, very simple interaction protocol. The question is, what should the learner do to, uh, to get as much reward as possible? Okay, so that's the question. Now, uh, just to make things concrete, let's say there are two arms, we're talking about K equals two, and each arm is a Bernoulli zero one, right? So it's like each arm is essentially a biased coin. So you flip it, you putting arm is flipping it. The arms are biased, so you don't know its true probability, okay? Um, all right, so um, let's say we first pull arm one, A1, uh, and uh, I get a reward, R1 equals one. So pulling the first arm, get one. Pulling the second arm, I get a zero. Question, at this point, what should I do? The third pull, should I pull arm one or arm two? And we can generalize this a little bit. Uh, I'm sorry, what, uh, I think I have some, something that's uh, keep beeping. Let me turn that off. Okay, can people see things okay? Yeah, looks good. All right, thanks. Sorry about that. Um, so more generally, right, you might be in a situation where you have already put arm one 10 times, and uh, out of the 10, seven times it, you get one, uh, three times you get zero, so you get an empirical estimate of 0.7. You have put arm two five times uh, with an empirical estimate of 0.4, right? What should you do for the next pool, for your 16th pool? Are you going to do arm one or arm two? Right, so that's the decision we have to make. And the intuition here is, um, this is intrinsically a trade-off. You don't know the arm distributions, you don't know their means, so you need to pull each one enough to get a reasonable estimate of which arm truly has the highest mean. But you don't want to overdo it. If you do it too much, then necessarily you are wasting some of the pulls on suboptimal arms and you don't get as much cumulative reward. Okay, so it's all about that critical balance. Um, 
So there are actually two distinct goals that uh, one can study. The first one is more natural. It's called uh, pure exploration. And this says you have T pools that you can use, capital T, and you can do whatever pools you want. Uh, the outcomes for those capital T pools, does, you, you're not charged against it, okay? So you can do whatever you want. But all you want to make sure is after those T pools, um, you have decided which army is the best. And that's, um, that's characterized here. You hope that the decision you make after all T pools, a capital T plus one uh, should be the best arm or uh, one of the best arms, and you want to maximize the probability of that happening. Now, this is a probabilistic statement simply because uh, along the way, all the rewards you see are random. Okay, so those are random variables and that would affect your decision, right? So, uh, so that's why it's a, it's a probability statement here. Another goal here, uh, which is distinct from uh, best arm identification, which is also known as pure exploration, is regret minimization, okay? And regret minimization is equivalent to just, you know, maximize the cumulative reward among the T trials, okay? So here you have to be careful. You, you don't want to pull suboptimal arms too much, right? Uh, we define regret, which is um, this mu star, which is the uh, best arms reward, average reward times T. So that's in expectation. If you just keep pulling the best arm, what, what would you get, right? Minus your cumulative reward. Okay, so there's a gap. Uh, it, it, everything is in expectation sense. Uh, we study this instead of cumulative reward simply because uh, this quantity can be bonded. So in some ways, this is very similar to exploration, uh, uh, exploration error, uh, sorry, estimation error in supervised learning. And this is clearly an exploration exploitation trade-off because um, as I was saying, if you explore too much, then you start to pull suboptimal arms excessively without you know, uh, in truly improving things. But if you don't explore too much, you, you decide on pulling an arm that looks good so far without fully be certain about it. That's called exploitation. And you may be trapped in your own false belief and miss a truly better arm. Okay, so that's a very delicate balance. Um, the one thing I want to, like, this is a very long theorem, but uh, one thing I want to um, uh, uh, you know, just emphasize here is there is a very nice way to think about problems of this nature, which is to say you should explore, but you should explore with some con in a, some controlled fashion. So let's look at this algorithm called the upper confidence bound or UCB algorithm. It's a quite famous algorithm for multi arm bandit. It's for the regret setting. Um, so, the, uh, so what you do is as a learner, you keep pulling arms, you accumulate mu hats. Those are nothing but just empirical estimates, right? So maximum likelihood estimate. Except that at any moment at iteration T, when you decide which arm to pull, you are taking the arg max of not just the empirical estimate of each arm, mu hat i, you stick another term, you add another term to it that takes the form of you know, square root log t over ti, where ti is the number of times the ith arm has been pulled so far up to time little t. Okay, what does this do? So let's imagine uh, you have not pulled arm two very much. So T2 would be very small at this moment. Uh, if it's small, that means the relative size of the square term will be large, as opposed to if you have put arm2 many times, then the square term will be small. Uh, this square root addition is known as a uh, exploration bonus. It uh, tries to encourage you to explore to pull arms that looks bad, uh, mu hat is small, but you have not sufficiently explored. And you may ask, where does this, uh, where does this bonus come from? Well, it comes from, uh, as we can see here, upper confidence bound. Uh, there's a, uh, the intuition is this mu hat plus that additional term, you can think of it as the confidence interval in which the true mu i lives in. 
Okay, this is the upper happiness bound. There's a you know mu i minus that. That's the lower bound that together form the interval. Um, there is there are some technical adjustments, but roughly speaking, that's what it is. And what you are doing is you are simply assuming because you have uncertainty in uh, arm mean estimate, you're just being super optimistic. You're just saying every arm uh, at the moment I'm going to assume it it can be as large as the confidence interval tells me. So that's what it is. Jerry, a clarification here. Yep. So um, mu hat i, is that the learner's estimate of the reward distribution of r i? It's, okay. uh, it's literally the maximum likelihood estimate, right? So if you flip a coin okay. 10 times, it's end up seven hats, it's 0. 0.7, nothing beyond that. And yep. then capital T sub a t, what is that? Ah. Right, so uh, little at is the arm the learner decides to pull, like arm one or arm two, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say a little at is two, it decides to pull arm number two. Uh, then capital T sub at is capital T two, right? That simply says, well, you, you increment the counter for arm two, you know, you now put it one more time, that's all. I see, okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, as you can see, this T, uh, T at increases, therefore, the bonus term would decrease as uh, you know as this goes on, right? But uh, again, if you didn't pull an arm for a very long time, um, that kind of the bonus relative bonus sticks out as being large relatively. Okay, um, so you can analyze this type of algorithm, and at the end of the day, you get a regret bound of the following sort. And what's really important here is the square root t term. Okay, you can ignore all other things. K is the number of um, arms. T is the total number of uh, iterations, total number of uh, interactions. Uh, what we want, what we like about this is, this is a standard no regret type of guarantee. That's a bad name. What the, this literally means is regret is the sum of, over all capital T's. If you cal calculate per time step, like you divide everything by capital T, that square root t becomes one over square root t, and uh, it become, it approaches zero as t increases, right? So that's asymptotically you have no regret. Okay, so that's the type of guarantee that we would like. Okay, so this is a very interesting algorithm. It achieves a no regret guarantee uh, by simply doing encourages exploration, but not too much, specifically by an upper confidence bound. Um, let me skip this and, uh, and talk about, uh, oh, wow. Okay, so uh, quickly, quickly, uh, contextual bandit is one level up where uh, now suddenly we have a notion of state. Okay, and then each state has K arms and uh, you know, they may have their own distinct distribution. Okay, so you pull this, uh, so as a learner, what happens is the environment in step three is going to draw a state for you and say, hey, look, that's your context. And for that context, you decide which arm is the best. So you essentially have, you know, separate multi-embedded problems, one for each state, okay? Um, this is an intermediate setting uh, the reason I introduced this is it really goes toward reinforcement learning. It's almost reinforcement learning, except that the next state is drawn in step three by the environment. And as you can see, it is drawn from a fixed distribution. It's not a conditional distribution. It does not depend on ST minus one. Okay, so that's important. So you can think of this setting as if it's a specialized reinforcement learning setting and uh, Markov decision process where the next state is, um, uh, is not a true sort of first order transition, but uh, there is a fixed new distribution uh, to draw the next state. Okay, so no transition essentially, no, no meaningful transition. Okay, uh, so that's that. Uh, but let me now jump to the real interesting thing, which is reinforcement learning. Um, a little bit more definition, but really the only difference is uh, from context, contextual bandit is now you have a first order state transition, in particular, the, uh, the third item. 
you now, if you are you were at state S, you perform some action A, your next state is going to be determined by a conditional distribution that depends on S. So you have uh, you know just one step of memory. It's the Markovian property. Uh, that's why it's called Markov decision process. Okay. Other than that, things are very straightforward. Uh, you still have reward distribution, but each, for each state, for different actions, you have different reward, right? So now we generalize arms to actions, but it's really the same thing. Uh, so you have K actions. There is the initial state distribution. So that defines where the whole thing starts as the first state is drawn from new, but otherwise it's following uh, the conditional distributions. There is also a discounting parameter. Uh, we will see that soon. That's really, I think of it for mathematical convenience. Okay, interaction protocol, uh, very straightforward. Uh, as we were saying, um, learner uh, has some policy, pi zero, and the policy is simply a mapping from the current state to, hey, what action should I perform? And this could be randomized. So in general, a policy maps a state to a distribution over uh, actions. So that's the policy. Now uh, in step two, environment starts from some S zero. Then for each time step, this learner in step four sees what state it is in. It's in ST. It looks up its policy pi and say, oh, I'm going to have this distribution over actions. And I'm going to draw my action AT from that distribution. Now. The environment is going to generate a reward from that uh, uh, ST AT combination. And furthermore, the environment is going to transit the learner to ST plus one according to the condition of first order um, transition, condition of probability. And uh, with this additional, you know, uh, knowledge, then the learner sees little RT and uh, little ST plus one. It will update its policy. Okay, so then the whole thing goes like that in iterations. Was there a comment? Um, I don't see anything. Okay, good. Um, then what do we want? We want to find good policies that will increase or maximize the value function. So what does this mean? This is literally the same as bandit, but you know, with more bells and whistles, simply because now you have to worry about a random trajectory. So the value function defined uh, for an S is defined as, you know, you start the interaction protocol from S0 being that S. You start from there, and then you simply follow pi and the whole MDP uh, interaction protocol you will generate a random sequence of rewards, little rt, that goes from zero to infinity. Here's where that discounting factor comes in. You are discounting each one by gamma to the t's power. So gamma, think of it as like 0 0.9. Uh, so what this does is it uh, literally puts more weight on immediate rewards and uh, smaller weight on future rewards so that things are uh, well-defined. But there's some evidence like people would discount future rewards. So that, that it's kind of like a hand wavy argument for why this is justified. Uh, to find this way, we can talk about optimum policy identification. That's one of two goals of reinforcement learning. The pi star here um, in the, is simply the policy that will result in the largest average uh, value. Here, average is taken over where you start the whole trajectory. That, uh, that's from the new distribution, okay? So that's a very well-defined concept. We want to, uh, sometimes we want to do that. Another type of analysis is when we do, again, regret minimization. So here we're simply saying, okay, if I know the optimum policy and I follow it for the whole trajectory, I get V pi star as my value, but as a learner, I don't know pi star. So I'm learning as we go. I incur this sequence of reward sequence, little RT. Um, that is usually inferior to the V pi star quantity. How much different is it? That's going to be the regret. Okay, I'm going to skip. Oh, I think we're running out of time. I'm going to skip a bunch of things. Uh, just want to show you, yeah, you can do proper analysis to uh, guarantee reinforcement learning actually works. 
And this is, by the way, a very hot research topic uh, for the last two years. Um, I just uh, may I have one minute. Or... Yeah, I think let's let's go till uh, thirty five past the hour. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So what I really want to say is uh, that's the standard reinforcement learning story uh, so far, but. What's interesting is you, because reinforcement learning is quite rich, there are multiple agents, you can start to introduce very interesting interactions. You can start to introduce like teachers and uh, the teachers are you know, helpful, right? So what might that look like? It turns out there are two senses of a helpful teacher, at least two senses in reinforcement learning. The first one is known as imitation learning. And the story here is you might have like a human expert, say a human professional race car driver who, is, who knows how to handle uh, driving. Think of driving as a reinforcement learning problem. You see the image in front of you of the street, the cars, et cetera. And uh, your action space is, let's say, the steering angle, uh, steering wheel angle. That's your action space, right? So that's a reinforcement learning problem. And uh, you might have human experts who are really good at uh, this task. Now, imitation learning says, well, look at uh, the expert. You can observe how experts drive a race car. Okay, so what you can realistically see is uh, the S sequence, meaning the, the scene in front of the car, you can capture it with a camera. You can capture the A sequence, action sequence, the sequence of um, steering wheel angles that the expert used to react to each scene. Uh, but you normally would not see the reward given by the world to the human driver. Okay, that's hidden to you. You cannot see that. So what you might have is a helpful expert who demonstrates a driving trajectory in the form of only S, A pairs, but not the Rs. So you're missing the R part, right? And uh, can you still use it to learn a good driving policy pi hat that performs as good as uh, the human driver? Um, the, the thing is, yes, you can, short answer, but uh, it requires specialized learners. And these are not going to be standard reinforcement learning algorithms. So that's point number one. You design specialized learner for that. And just to give you, uh, there are two uh, big families under this heading of imitation learning. One is simply behavior cloning. And that simply says, look at the state action, state action pair. That is nothing but a classification problem. I can train a classifier. So if, I give, if I'm given a state, I predict how the human driver would perform, which action the human driver would perform. So we just break it down into you know, a supervised learning problem. That's one type of uh, method called behavior cloning. The other type of uh, uh, method is called inverse reinforcement learning. And here, the learner tries to estimate the hidden, the latent uh, reward function. So that's helpful teacher number one. Uh, let me just, this is the last slide. Okay, the helpful teacher number two is a very different type of uh, teacher. It helps a standard reinforcement learner. Okay, so think of it as, you know, still the student is interacting with the standard multi Markov decision process environment and generating the usual trajectory as A, R, S prime uh, trajectories. However, imagine a new entity called a teacher who can insert herself in between the environment and the student. And in particular, what the teacher can do is it can modify uh, the, either the reward or the state transition that the learner experiences. Okay, so for example, the teacher can you know, add a little delta to the environment generated reward and this R plus delta will then be given to the student. Okay, now to the RL learner, it doesn't know it's, there's a teacher. So it's just going to take the modified experience and learn from it. But for the teacher's from the teacher's perspective, the teacher knows what is an optimum policy. So the question here is, how can the teacher or can the teacher even design a sequence of say deltas uh, for the reward change so that it helps the student learn 
the optimum policy pi star as quickly as possible. Okay. And that problem turns out to be, it certainly has a flavor of machine teaching. And it turns out to solve that problem is a high level RL or planning problem for the teacher herself. Uh, this is another problem where the teacher needs to plan ahead for the set of deltas uh, without fully knowing what how the student might react. And importantly, the high level state representation from the teacher's perspective would include learners in their internal model at that moment. So it's going to be an enriched state space and it's a it's a much bigger, much more complex reinforcement learning problem. Um, so that's kind of what I want to get out uh, as a very high level uh, point here too. You know, these are some things happening in the machine learning community and we know some of them, uh, we know how to analyze some of them. Uh, so hopefully this uh, would encourage some dialogue between our communities. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you for a really excellent tutorial um, that covered such a broad and deep topic in uh, less than two hours. Uh, we have a couple of questions here. Uh, I know we're over time, but let's do this. Uh, Radu Grosu and then Anna Lukina. Hi, Jerry. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Very nice. Uh, I just wanted uh, to ask you about uh, the first, uh, the previous slide on the teacher. This yeah, one? so. So actually, you, you could use supervised learning to, uh, you know, to just learn uh, the actions, you know, uh, what, uh, what the, the controller, the policy yeah, is yeah. supposed to do. Yeah, uh, yeah. So your point is that uh, the teacher might not be optimal. And uh, that's why you, uh, I mean, the expert might be not optimal. He's providing you the trajectories, but uh, he might have not optimized the rewards. And right. then the idea is to, to find out how to optimize that. Uh, is that what you That's want? one way to look at it, right? So uh, as you pointed out, one limitation in this kind of imitation learning setting uh, is if you just do behavior cloning specifically, uh, then it is limited by how good the human expert is, right? So the, the human policy may not be the optimum policy yet. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so um, if you just do human, uh, behavior cloning, you're, you're certainly, you know, just try to mimic what the human does, which is suboptimal policy. Uh, yeah, like, like when you're a driver, you, if you just learn from the, from the teacher, you know, and uh, then you are not never going to be better than the, the, the teacher. Right. But you, right. you, if you learn on your own, you might become actually a Formula okay. One uh, driver. Yes. And this is sometimes called uh, to achieve uh, superhuman performance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, excellent. All right. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Anna, did you have a question? Uh, yes, thanks. I have a question about active learning. Yes. So in the active learning setting, is there something, um, is there some theory about modeling the Oracle itself, the human supervisor, well, uh, okay. the human expert? such yeah. that the machine approach could also kind of predict the labels at some point. Oh, okay. Um, uh, so these are actually two separate questions. Let me try to address them. In the standard uh, assumption, uh, yes, you can. So what this is, is um, uh, uh, basically the standard model is, um, well, I give you, a, like, let's say I'm the active learner, I give you a query X and you are the human expert, right? What I assume of you is if you are very good, you should just give me H star of X, like a deterministic label. But if uh, I'm, I recruit, say, crowdsourcers, and they're not super good, right, and they're distracted, they're watching TV or whatever while doing my task, they will give me noisy labels. And that is modeled usually as a PY given X such that H star X should still be the sort of the best uh, among the, within the, you know, the conditional class distributions, but you put probability mass on other labels, right? So it's, it's a way to model like noisy uh, feedback. Uh, unfortunately, just by having this kind of model directly doesn't give me as the active learner a way to predict that uh, H star. 
like I can easily model uh, uh, add a noise model on top of what uh, the H star is, but I don't have enough information to assume what H star is, if that makes sense. So that's kind of the answer to your second question in that uh, just by assuming the behavior of the oracles doesn't give me the truth. You can model how bad they are, but you don't know what their true answer is. Mm -hmm. But based on this uh, noisy model, I can maybe be skeptical about the labels of the experiment. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's very important. So in fact, um, this, is, uh, this is actually quite important. For many problems, you should assume noisy label. And in doing so, for example, our binary search would not work because you are not supposed to cut off half of your uh, hypothesis space, right, based on one answer. Uh, so that's going to uh, put uh, like, yeah, it's going to make active learning weaker, really, because you need a lot more queries just to be certain. And it turns out, if you have noise in uh, labeled answers, sometimes you will not no longer be able to achieve exponential speed up. I see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, I think with that, uh, let's uh, thank Jerry again for really an excellent tutorial. Thank you all. And I, I want to mention that we are following up this tutorial. Uh, I think it really sets the stage for a few sessions to come in this workshop. So we'll have at least two, probably more uh, uh, sessions that talk about machine learning and synthesis. So I think Jerry, your tutorial has helped set the basic uh, ground for uh, what's to come now. Thank you. Great. Thank you all. Great. Thank you very much, Jerry. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.